planning meeting. I'm excited about the opportunities that are before us. I believe uh, that 2020, with all of its craziness, uh, is still has uh, the, the great potential to be a landmark, life-changing, historical year for the Virginia Beach Potter's House. How many are with me this morning? Hallelujah. Let's go before the Lord in, uh, in the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to uh, one of the greatest chapters uh, in the book of Luke and in the New Testament uh, at large. It is the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. It is a chapter of three stories. And all of them are incredibly powerful for us today. I want to focus in on one of these stories that is so inspiring and so helpful and so instructive to every believer, no matter where you are on the spectrum of your faith, no matter where you are in the walk of your Christianity. I believe that we can all be inspired and challenged uh, by this message today. So would you join me this morning as we look together? I want you to think about, for just a moment, uh, let me see your hand if you are saved in this place. You know that you know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. I want you to think about how did that salvation take place? Every one of you that just put your hand up, you've got a story, don't you? You've got a story of how you were lost in your sins. You were lost in confusion. You were bound in things that you're ashamed of that we wouldn't want to talk about here together this morning. You and I were people that did not deserve God's mercy or God's grace. In fact, what we deserved was God's wrath and condemnation, didn't we? And somewhere along the way, you and I had an encounter that there was, we realized that looking back on it, I realized that the Holy Spirit was leading and guiding my life and bringing me to a certain point. I didn't know it at the time. But what we can all testify of is that none of us got saved in a vacuum. There is nobody here that you were smart enough all on your own to figure out the message of the gospel, right? That message of the gospel was delivered to you. Now, yes, there might be some rare cases of people who are just receive a Bible and they just start reading and they figure it out and they get convicted and they repent of their sins. But I want to tell you, those people are few and far between. For 90% of Christians, and probably more than that, the reason that you got saved is because there was somebody that God used to find you. How many can testify of that? God used somebody. Maybe somebody who wasn't the sharpest crayon in the box. Maybe somebody who wasn't the brightest bulb in the pack. Maybe somebody who was missing a few french fries from the Happy Meal. But God used somebody. Whether it was a preacher on a television screen, whether it was a co-worker or a friend, whether it was your family, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, somebody that you knew. But somebody had the courage to speak up in the moment that you were lost. And aren't you glad that they did this morning? I want you to think about that person or those people that influenced you to bring you to the moment of salvation. And I want you to think, where would you be today unless they would have had that courage to speak up and put an arm around you and say, there's a better way. Let me show you what it means to live for God. Can we all be grateful this morning for those people and that person who prayed you to salvation? That believed God for you, that overcame their own selfish desires 
for you that overcame the, uh, the awkwardness of a, a spiritual conversation with somebody who's still living in sin? How many know that can be awkward? And yet, somebody, God used somebody to find you. Now, I'm not preaching false doctrine and saying that people saved you. Far from it. I am saying this morning that we know God saved us, but how did God save us? He used an instrument. He used a person to help you. And that is what I want to preach about this morning. I want to preach about the shepherd who goes and searches for the lost sheep in our scripture. And this is a message I've titled, The Urgent Search. And I want you to follow along with me in Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Now, every story in the Bible has a context. Jesus is going to tell us a parable, but first we learn what is the context. Why does he tell this parable? And it starts here in verse 1. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, oh, such a terrible thing that Jesus preaching to people who need to hear preaching. They complained about this, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Scoff. Bad Jesus for talking to people who need him. So, this is the context in which Jesus launches off into a parable that we're going to examine this morning. So he spoke to them this parable, saying, verse 4, Which man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. And I say to you, that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Let's pray for just a moment. Father, we come by the blood of Jesus, and we thank you for the opportunity we have here this morning. God, bless this time together in the Word and in worship. I'm praying that you would equip us and empower us, God, to be those shepherds searching for lost sheep. I pray that you would give us all a courage Give us all a mandate. Give us all the encouragement right now to go and search for lost sheep. And we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' mighty name. God's people would say, amen. amen. So Jesus, of course, was doing what Jesus does. He was preaching. He was praying. He was teaching. And as he was going about his business, doing what God had called him to do, uh, he was d fulfilling the purpose that God had sent him to do. And he was teaching incredible things. Can you imagine what it would have been like to just sit and listen to Jesus teaching and preaching, speaking about morality and the kingdom of God and uh, our, the call to repentance? And it seems that as Jesus was doing this, there was a certain kind of people that were attracted to his ministry. Maybe the kind of people that you would be ashamed to hang out with. They were the bad people, the immoral people, people who were famous for lying and cheating. The oldest, uh, uh, the, the oldest uh, <laughs> what do they say? That the prostitutes, that they, they even they were wondering and and. Uh, and interested in what Jesus was talking about. The drunks, the liars, the addicts, the downcast of society. And there they are. They've, they have heard what Jesus is speaking about. And the Bible says they loved to hear him teach. 
Not only did they love to hear Him, not only did they make time out of their days to come and and receive what Jesus said, but the Bible says that they were hungry for His words. They could not get enough of Jesus' teaching. Do you know why that is? You know, um, I have a, a, a bottle of pills on top of my refrigerator. They are allergy pills. And uh, I have some sensitive allergies, and so if I, if I miss that pill, you know, I'm all messed up, man. My nose and my sinuses, and, and, uh, and so I have to be pretty careful to, that I make sure to, to take that thing every day. Now, for somebody who doesn't have the same allergies like I do, that bottle of pills means nothing to you, right? You could throw it, you could take it, you wouldn't even know that you took it. Or you could throw it away and you wouldn't even notice. But to me, that bottle of of allergy pills is quite important. I have to take it with me if I go on a trip. If I don't, I'm going to have a bad trip. Everybody with me so far? To you, the bottle of pills may not be important. But to me, very important. Why? Because I'm sick and I need a cure. This is how to explain why these uh, liars and cheaters and prostitutes and tax collectors and the scoundrels of society, this explains why they were so attracted to the ministry of Jesus. Because guess what? They were sick and he had the cure. Jesus even makes this statement in the Gospels. He says, He says, uh, uh, someone who is well has no need of a doctor, right? Someone who feels fine, everything's good, everything looks good from the surface, I'm feeling good, I'm looking good, I don't need to go to the doctor. But if I've got a, a giant gaping wound on my arm and everybody can see it, it's very foolish for me to walk around and say, hey, I don't need a doctor. If you have giant gaping wounds in your life, it makes sense. You need to go to an emergency room. Go have a doctor look at that. Have him help you. This explains to us why these kinds of people were attracted to Jesus. The religious people, of course, of their day couldn't figure this out. They had rejected these scoundrels and scandalous people, and they didn't want to be around them. Now, it's, it's a good thing that religious people don't act like that anymore in 2020. I uh, don't want to associate with the wrong kind of people. Uh, I don't want to have any dealings with those people. Uh, those people who have problems with immorality and uh, you know, I wouldn't want to invite them into my house. Oh, oh no, no, no. I, I, I wouldn't want things to go missing. You know what I mean? I, I, wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want my children to be in danger. I, oh, oh, no. I, I, let, let's just uh, uh, let's keep them on the other side. Good thing nobody acts like that anymore. The religious people rejected these kinds of people, but Jesus received them. He received them. Listen to what the Pharisees and the scribes complained about. Verse 2, this man, Jesus, he receives sinners and even you eats with them. Yucky. Why would he do that? Don't they, doesn't Jesus, don't you know, Jesus, what these people are involved with? To eat with somebody just as much then as it is now, it means to receive them, to have them at your table with you. It speaks about relationship, doesn't it? It speaks about a certain amount of intimacy to sit down and have a meal with someone. This is why we encourage as a, as a way of reaching out to people. I know with COVID-19 and all of this craziness that's happening, we haven't been able to as much, but there is almost nothing you can do better than go to get a coffee with somebody. Let's sit down. Let's have a cheeseburger together. Let me come over to my house. We'll, I'll cook up a bowl of popcorn. And we can sit down and talk together. Jesus, the, 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 that 
the fact that Jesus was inviting these people into his life and associating with them and giving them dignity and value and worth and spending time with them and ministering to them. Boy, the religious people, they didn't like that. Not at all. Oh, no, 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 Jesus. You're not supposed to be like that. Those are the, those are the nasty people. They were amazed that such a great teacher full of great words would even associate with these people. Let me ask you first of all this morning, are you a Pharisee? What goes through your mind when you see someone drunk and out of their mind? Ew. I'm glad I'm not like that person. Like the Pharisee prayed in Luke 18, the Pharisee prayed and said, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like those other men. See, this is one of the problems many times of Christians as we gain some experience as believers is that we become so separated from our sins. And yes, we are horrified by our own sins and our own past. And I say, I don't want to have anything to do with that anymore, right? I don't want to be involved in that life anymore. And then we see somebody, or we know somebody addicted to drugs, involved in fornication, lust, pornography. And it's easy for us to have that reaction. Can we be real? Say, ew, how can you keep doing that? That's nasty. And it is nasty. How could you continue in your sin? I got free, so you need to be free. And we can very easily slip into the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees. I don't want my children being around that. I don't want that person sitting next to me in the church service. Far, far be it from me. And so, to explain himself and to rebuke the Pharisees and to give dignity to people that needed his ministry, Jesus begins to tell a parable, a powerful parable, a story that should have profound impact on us this morning. It still has not lost its power after these 2,000 years, and it is the parable of the lost sheep. And so in verse 4, Jesus begins this story, and he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. So get the picture here. It's a shepherd. In many languages, it's the word pastor. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've, you know, this is one of the problems of a, a modern world that we live in is that we're, we don't associate with anybody who is a real shepherd. I've seen real shepherds, right? When we lived in Bulgaria. Uh, there were shepherds that lived there. And if you, all you would have to do is drive out of the city about five, ten minutes, and you start finding a few villages around the outskirts of town, and you will see shepherds. And what they do is uh, modern-day shepherds, uh, they're not very much different from ancient shepherds. And what they will do is they will go around to the various farms in the little village. And if, if one farmer has uh, five or ten little sheep, uh, the, the, the shepherd will come and he'll say, come with me. And he'll take the farmer's sheep and he'll lead them. And he's got a staff and he'll lead them out into the hills, into the countryside. And the shepherd knows where the various uh, places are that, are that are good for sheep. He knows the good meadow to eat some good grass. He knows a good place where there's a stream they can drink from. He knows a good place up on the hill that they can have a nap halfway through the day, and he will take the sheep around, he'll lead them, and if he's got sheep from that farmer and this farmer, and he'll lead them around during the day, and when the night comes, guess what he does? He brings them all back home. I've seen them. I remember one time, as, uh, we, we were there in Bulgaria, and we were just trying to... <laughs> We were just trying to figure out what this place was all about. So we had a, a car, and we started driving around, you know, being curious Americans. Just got to drive around. Let's see this place. Let's go for an adventure. And so one of our, uh, one of our adventures, is, 
uh, we would always be turning down roads, and we don't know where they go. And we turned down this one road, and it took us down this country through this village, and we found this little meadow next to a stream. And I was like, this is a really nice little spot. There's nothing around. And so we got out. I had some sandwiches. We were just sitting there on the grass, me and Taya, in the, in the nice uh, Bulgarian springtime. It was a beautiful day. Sitting there, uh, eating some sandwiches, and then we heard clang, 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 clang clang, clang, and we looked up, and there was a little hill right over here, and the shepherds started coming down. There was one shepherd and probably 40 or 50 sheep behind him, and he came down, down and I was like, wow, it's a real shepherd. Those are real sheep, just like Jesus taught about. It was the first time I'd seen such things in, in uh, living in, a, you know, the United States. You don't see things like that growing up in the city, you know, and, and so it was amazing. I'm I'm watching. This is, this is how shepherds have lived for millennium. He is doing the same thing that shepherds did 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. And I'm witnessing it as he takes his little group of sheep and he leads them down. And, <laughs> and listen, this guy, he was probably 14 years old. He was uh, looking tattered, you know, I mean, you don't got to get dressed up to lead sheep around. He wasn't wearing a tie. He had a big old hat on, cover his, his head from the sun. And he had a staff, and he had a big piece of straw hanging out of his... And he was chewing on it. It was like a cartoon, man. And he brought his sheep down, and, uh, and the sheep saw the water, and they started drinking the water. And you know what the shepherd did? He laid down and took a nap. <laughs> it, was, it was such a pristine... Uh, scenario. It was amazing to watch. And, uh, and so I'm thinking about this shepherd. What would happen if he would have lost one of those sheep? See, because the sheep don't actually belong to the shepherd. The sheep belong to the farmers from this village and that village and that village. And his, his responsibility is to take care of them until the end of the day when he can bring them back to their sheepfolds. And so if you could imagine this scenario where he wakes up from his nap and he starts counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, oh, I'm at 48 instead of 49. Where's the lost one? Because guess who gets in trouble if there's a lost sheep? The shepherd does. So now he's worried. He's worried because the sheep is lost. What does it mean to be lost? If you can understand the power of sin, then you know what it means to be lost. To be lost means to be on the road that leads to destruction. You know the problem with sheep, right? The problem with sheep is that they have no natural defenses. They are susceptible to injury, danger, and harm from every side. They are not predators. They are prey. They are easily scared. They are easily injured. And a sheep wandering by itself is on the road to destruction. It's going to be cut off. And if, if it is not found soon, not only will the shepherd be in trouble, but the sheep will lose its life. This lost sheep, beloved, is a picture of lost souls. Men and women, without Christ, you know them. You know their names. You sit by them every day. Maybe they even live in your own house. And without the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they are just as lost as one of those little sheep who has wandered off from his shepherd. And if they do not change direction, how many understand that lost leads to destruction? Lost does not lead to the promised land. Lost does not lead to better things. Lost leads to death. How does a sheep get lost anyway? The sheep gets lost in a couple of ways. 
that, you know, there's a lot of ways to get lost. There's only one way to get found. It's just like there's a, there's a lot of ways to destroy something. There's only one way to build it right. Right? That's why demolition, when we're going to tear these walls down, everybody's excited about demolition. Yeah, I get to swing a, swing a hammer and break things. Yeah! Oh, but when, but when it's time to, you know, piece together perfectly fit boards and lay carpet, it's, it's pretty hard to find volunteers at that time. There's a certain excitement. How many understand? There's a certain excitement about the idea of something out there in the wilderness. One of the ways that sheep get lost is that they think to themselves, ooh, ooh, what's this? Ooh, what's that? Curiosity, they say killed the cat. And a sheep, he will, he will move from one little uh, spot of grass until he eats it all, and he goes over here. There's another little spot. Ooh, that's a nice piece of grass. Ooh, here's a nice little tumbleweed. And before he knows it, he's hopped from grass to bush to play, and then he turns around and says, where am I? I'm lost. How many understand the world can do that to us? The world can do that to people that you love and care about? That maybe innocently, you know, we, we click on one website and it goes to another website and it goes to another website and then it goes to someplace, ooh, that has profound effect on your future. And maybe it starts innocent with one girl that you have a, a conversation with and, oh, that's fun, talk to a girl or talk to a boy. Oh, that's, oh, that's great, it's exciting, it's fun, it's fulfilling. And, and we talk to this girl and that girl and that, and that boy and that boy. And, and, and before you know it, it can lead our souls astray. Hobbies. It's not bad to have a hobby. I love to have hobbies. I love people who get interested in certain things. But how many know you can have a hobby which leads to another hobby, which leads to a fascination, which leads to an obsession, which leads to, I don't want to go to church on Sunday morning. I'm busy. This is how sheep get lost. Not because they started off saying, you know what, I want to run away from my shepherd. He's a jerk. No. Simply through distraction Simply through not knowing what's, what's next. The problem with getting lost is that you don't know that you're lost until you get there. You think that you're in the right spot, but you're not. And that's why it's easy for us as human beings, even in the church, I shudder to think how many lost people are sitting in churches at this very moment saying, oh no, I'm found, I'm exactly where, I know, I know where I am, I'm right, where am I? See, the sheep, the sheep can easily get lost on his own. There's another problem, though, and that is with the shepherd. If the shepherd is not carefully watching over the sheep, he can easily be lost. There is a dual responsibility here. Not all of the responsibility lays on the sheep. To be lost is in the sheep's nature. But it is the responsibility of the shepherd to watch over his sheep. And so if there is a shepherd, if there is a person that has been tasked to watch over and take care and keep track of a wandering sheep, and if that shepherd takes a nap on the job, guess what? It's not all the sheep's fault for walking away. First of all, are you a lost sheep? Is it possible that you've come to the service this morning and you know exactly where you, you could find yourself on a map today, you could find yourself on Google Maps, but what about the spiritual location of your soul today? Where are you? Because it's possible to be in a church service like this and to be completely going the wrong direction in your life. Am I still preaching this morning? Listen to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Sheep get lost very easily. Say, no, pastor, I'm smarter than that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm able to, 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 to kick off the dust and come back anytime I want to. Really? I hear people say, I could quit smoking anytime I want to. I could quit looking at pornography anytime I wanted to. And why don't you? See, that's, the, that's what the lost sheep says to himself. I'm not lost. They're just right on the other side of the hill, right? Meanwhile, the wolf is lurking. Let me ask you this morning, do you know any lost sheep? Because the truth is, all of us are lost. Without Christ, we know what it means to get lost. And I dare to say that there are still a few lost sheep in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Portsmouth, Norfolk, Hampton Roads. There's still a few lost sheep around here, aren't there? Maybe you know a lost sheep. I want you to begin thinking about some people in your life that are wandering around in dangerous placing, places. Jude 1.13 says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Can I tell you that it is not good to be lost? It's not good that your friends are lost. It's not good that your family is lost. It's not good that people you care about are lost. You know why? Because lost leads to destruction. Do you still care about that? Does that still move you? You think about friends, family, neighbors who live across from you that with, unless they are found, they'll be judged in their sins. Can I tell you, Jesus cares about them. He is the ultimate, the, the shepherd who came to give his life for the sheep. He's the one who went after them. He's the one who came after you. Listen to what Jesus, in Matthew 9, 36, he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion for them because they were wearied and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. He was moved with compassion. Listen, one of the problems with so many believers today is that we know there's a lot of lost people, but we're no longer moved. No longer moved. Yeah, big deal. There's always going to be lost people. What should I do about it? Don't ever come to the place in your life that you are not moved for lost souls. Aren't you glad somebody was moved for your lost soul? Aren't you glad somebody was moved with compassion like Jesus was for your life? And so we close with this last thought. The urgency. The urgency. See, the shepherd, when he realizes a sheep is lost, he doesn't just fold his hands and put them behind his head and say, I think it's time for a nap. He urgently goes about the business of finding what was lost. That's what Jesus said. If he loses one of them, he, he leaves the 99 in the wilderness to go after the one which is lost until he finds it. I want you to say that out loud. Until he finds it. Say it again. Until he finds it. He's made up his mind, didn't he? He said, I am not going to stop searching. I am not going to stop. These 99, they're safe. They're okay. But there's one that's lost. And I'm going to go find that one no matter what it takes. This is the attitude of Jesus, isn't it? That he looked down at a world of lost sheep. He said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to give my entire life until I find what was lost. That shepherd went after the sheep that was in need. What we need in this congregation is we need people who are just as urgent about lost souls 
as Jesus was. Some of you are worried about my phone that it just got broken. And you're not worried that there are broken people who live on your streets. You're not worried about broken people that are in your families. You're not worried about broken people who live in our neighborhood right across the street behind the church. Why are we more concerned about a broken phone than about broken souls? See, we must be urgently convinced that there is value in lost people. There was nothing more important to the shepherd at this moment. Nothing more important. He said, my life is on the line. The life of that sheep is on the line. And if I don't save them, that sheep will be destroyed. Listen to what Jesus said. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Jesus crying out with compassion for His people, for His city, for a lost city that rejected Him. And He's crying out. Who do you cry out to God for? You know, we have this prayer list. And it's great that we put some names on here. We're believing God for them. But is that all we do? We just put them on a name? so that pastor will pray for them at the beginning of service? Maybe we ought to see some urgency this morning. Luke 19, verse 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He sought until he found. He did not give up. There were difficulties, yes. Yeah, difficult to find lost sheep. You have to hurry. You have to move quickly before the sun goes down. You know, There's awkwardness involved. Look, you have to correct people. You have to overcome your personal fears. You have to overcome your your own insufficiencies and your own lack of self-confidence. And it's hard to, to reach out to lost people. Yes, it is. But you know what's harder? Going to hell! The shepherd kept on seeking until he found. He never slacked. He never backed off. He never gave up. What about you? What about you this morning? Yes, we are like the sheep, but most of us, you put your hand up at the beginning of the service and said that you've been found. I'm so happy for you. Do you know what that means? Now you get to be a shepherd. Now you get to be the one who goes out and finds someone who's lost. And our job, do you know what ministry is? We have all these ideas of what ministry is. Ministry means you have to put on a suit and a tie. No. No, ministry means you you get your own television program. That's ministry. No. No, ministry means, what what ministry means is, is, you know, you have to have uh, some kind of uh, degree from a Bible college if you're going to have ministry. No. Do you know what ministry is? Finding lost sheep. You know, I talked about that little shepherd that I saw on the hill that day in Bulgaria. This was not a high flyer. He did not have a pretty face. He did not have nice clothing. But what did he have? He had eyes on his sheep. What about you? That's ministry. That's ministry. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit to have ministry. You don't have to memorize the Bible. You don't have to be the greatest prayer warrior of all time. All you need is something in here, a desire to find those that are lost, to urgently seek and save those who are lost. And I'm telling you, If you can get that in here, then you will be aligned with the Savior because that's the heart that He has. That's the heart that He has. And when you begin to see people around you as lost sheep, you will begin to see the world as God sees it. You'll begin to understand that other things in life are not as important. Your team 
is not as important as saving lost souls. Your hobby is not as important as saving lost souls. Your entertainment is not as important as finding lost sheep. Because in the end, your team, your hobby, your entertainment, guess what? It's all going to pass away. But do you know what doesn't pass away? Souls. Let's look at the results. Verse 5, after he has found it. The miracle has occurred. He has found the lost sheep. Thank God. Look at what he does. When he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Everybody say rejoicing. Let me ask you right now, would your life be better or worse if you lived a life of rejoicing? Your life would be better. Because when you are rejoicing at the joy of others, your life is filled to capacity. Whenever I read that scripture, I think about a conference that I went to in Brasov, Romania. And you probably heard me tell this story, but it's okay. I'll tell it again. <laughs> in in uh, a conference in Brasov, Romania, and there was a pastor there preaching one of the morning seminars about finding lost sheep. Probably the same scripture that I'm using this morning. And he actually had somebody go to a local village to pick up a sheep and bring it into the service as an illustration. And so I remember Pastor Christy Karamidaru was tasked somehow with carrying in the sheep on his shoulders. What he didn't anticipate, what he didn't expect, was that that sheep was covered with filth. It smelled bad. Both the, the, this end and this end were covered in all kinds of filth. All right? You understand what I'm saying? And here he is. He has to put his, this sheep onto his shoulders and carry it into the conference building, and it was stinking. It was, ugh, it was horrible. And, and he was standing, like, right here on the side of the platform, and from here, I was sitting, like, where Mr. Alonzo is right now, and from there, I could smell the smell. And here's Pastor Christie with this thing draped around his shoulders. How many understand that saving sheep, can you, you, you might get, get some filth on you? It might be a stinky and smelly job. It might be some things that causes discomfort. But all of that discomfort and that bad smell could not outweigh the joy. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was Lost. I want to share with you this morning that there is no joy in all the world better than finding a lost soul. There are very few things in my life that I have greater joy over. The birth of my children, my marriage, you know, my, my salvation, I, those things bring me incredible, incredible joy. But when I think about the things in my spiritual life, that bring me greatest joy, I think about the people that God used me to save. I think about Radostin Tsvetkov. Radostin Tsvetkov, when, he, when I first met him, he was 14 years old. He had, he, had, uh, he had some mental problems. He had been rejected by his family. His parents had been divorced, and he had taken the brunt of it on himself. He was suicidal. And he came into our church, and, and he was broken, man. And all I did was spend some time with him. He had learned all of his English, and he spoke pretty good English, but all of his English he had learned from the Cartoon Network. And because he knew some English, I could speak to him and minister to him. And in the next two years, this boy radically changed. Not because I'm superhuman or super special, but simply because I showed him the gospel. When we came back to America, he, uh, there were some ups and downs, but then when he was 
24, this is just a couple of years ago, 24 years old. He had always had a congenital, congenital heart defect that had given him problems when he was young. But he was, uh, one day he was in his church and he was leading the teen group. He had about six or seven teenagers with him at 24 years old. He was leading the group of teenagers in his church. And they were out one day playing basketball. And the story goes that they were having a great time and, and he collapsed on the basketball court. And he died right there and went to eternity. 24 years old. As soon as I heard it, I said, I have to go to his funeral. This was a couple years ago. And I went back to Bulgaria to take part in his funeral. And it was amazing to me to think about that I know that that boy is in heaven today. And God used me. I want to tell you, there's almost nothing in this life that brings me that kind of joy. To know that he was a lost sheep on the road to destruction, and there's nothing special about Adam Dragoon, except I was in the right spot at the right time, and I was able to minister him, and he got saved. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to wrap my arms around that Rodostin Svetkov, and I'm going to say, I'm glad you're here with me, brother. What greater joy could there be than that? What greater joy does your entertainment bring you that would be better than that? What is better about making a few more dollars? Is that really going to outweigh the joy of wrapping your arms around people that God used you to bring to heaven? Do you see that we are part of something incredible this morning? We are a part of reaching lost sheep. There is no joy in all the world greater than the finding of a lost soul. He called all of his neighbors together. He rejoiced with them. He called it my sheep, my sheep, which was lost. No matter how dirty, filthy, unclean it had been, no matter where it had gone in its travels. I want to tell you, we must be about finding lost sheep. Now, we have been in this strange time where our church, we haven't been doing outreach events on Saturdays. And so you don't have that excuse anymore. Well, at least I go to outreach once in a while. You know, can I just remind you that every day you are alive, you're on outreach? Can I just remind you that the reason why God gives you breath in your lungs, there's no other reason than to reach the lost souls that are around you? whether they are your children in your own house or your neighbors or your co-workers or people that you pray. Listen, you are on outreach. The only time you're not on outreach is when you're in church. When you're here, you can take a break. But as soon as you go out the door, you're on outreach, my brother. You're on outreach, my sister. You're going to be around lost sheep. And you know, the only thing a lost sheep needs is a good shepherd. You don't have to be highly qualified. You don't have to have all the right words. You don't have to have it all together. I understand God's working on all of us. But guess what? You're still called to find lost souls. Isaiah 6, verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Could God move your heart this morning, bring your attention, not to the 99 that are found, but to the few that are lost? My hope this morning is that God would renew the urgency of your soul. Because you know, one day, outreach will be over. And that day is coming very soon. And those who are not found Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes for just a moment. As we bring this service to a close. As God is dealing with hearts this morning, oh, what love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that He would send His only Son, Jesus Christ, 
the great high shepherd, the chief shepherd, the shepherd whom we all follow, that he was willing to give his life for wayward, wandering sheep such as us. And maybe you're here this morning, you know that you're not right with God. You are one of those wandering sheep that I described. You are lost in your sin and bound to it. But here's the hope. The gospel has the ability to change your life. Change your life. There are people across this building today that their lives have been radically changed by the gospel. And your life can be changed too. No matter what sin you may be involved in, no matter where your lost wanderings have taken you, there is a shepherd right now reaching out to you by His Holy Spirit, His grace and His mercy. The Holy Spirit of God is what brings us to be found. And if you're here this morning and you recognize your need for salvation, your need for forgiveness, you say, Pastor, what do I do? You must trust and believe in Christ, that He is who He says He is. And then you must repent of your sins, turning from them, and believe that Jesus can forgive you. If that's you today, I want to pray with you, prayer, salvation. And you be honest right now and say, I know I'm lost, but I need to be found. Can I pray with you this morning? You lift up your hand. Is there someone here? Quickly, believe in God. It's easy. It's very easy to think that you know where you are and be totally lost. Are you this morning, are you, can you be honest enough to recognize that you don't know where you are, where you're going when you die? There is a God in heaven who wants to reach out to you right now and save you from your sins. Is there someone here? Quickly, lift up your hand. Anyone at all? Say, yes, please pray for me. I need salvation. I need God's grace and mercy. Is there someone, anyone at all? Quickly, backslidden in your heart. All right, let me speak to the church right now. Where are the shepherds? Where are the shepherds? Where are the people, the men and women, who say, I see lost sheep everywhere. I see them all around me. Where's the urgency? It's not enough for us just to get our lives together and get half a brain working, work a job, make a paycheck, raise a family, all of those things. Those are necessary. Those are wonderful things. But can we realize that there's still a few lost, lost, bound and broken? When I look at the chaos that is erupting in our society,